Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. The texts for the sixth Sunday after Pentecost on July 17th, 2022, uh, are these. The thematic first reading is Genesis 18, verses 1 through 10a. The semi-continuous first reading is Amos 8, 1 through 12. We're going to look at Psalm 15. Colossians, our second in a series, chapter 1, verses 15 through 28. And from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. A very sticky story about Mary and Martha and Jesus. Martha, Martha, Martha. That's all I can Mary, understand. Mary, Mary, I believe, is the one. Ah. Martha, Martha. No. I'm dating myself. But uh, yes. <laughs> some people will get that. Yeah. Marsha was definitely my favorite, too. She was the oldest. I was. Uh -huh. so. Yeah. Yeah. It, you, yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah. I still follow Maureen McCormick. Oh, I follow Maureen you? McCormick on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, get updates about her life and things and insights into the world and. I think we're avoiding a really difficult text. We are. So I'm just <laughs> going to put a context around this that um, for the next few weeks, at least uh, the way that uh, I began to look at these is that we're going to be talking about the idea of being distracted by good things. And so uh, this, this is a perfect text to uh, begin that kind of recognition uh, of uh, how do we balance uh, when we're doing what you know, superficially or even responsibly is the right thing. And yet it is distracting us from doing a, a more right thing or a more important thing. Um, so I just want to put that out there as we as we go through both this uh, this gospel, but also as we uh, particularly get in the next few weeks into the, the pro uh, prophets. Mm, good. Yeah. Good. Well, and also that the theme of, you know, Martha, Martha, you were worried. Uh, we saw that back in, uh, uh, we'll see that in 1222 coming up where uh, Jesus uh, talks about that as well. I'm trying to find it here. He said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body. Just And so here we are in this, you know, in this long travel narrative, right? And uh, but it's worth it's worth noting that too, I think Joy, along with that verb of distracted, can be translated troubled or bothered uh, as well. But that we are that that sense what we get, I think, is that sense of what is it that sort of uh, uh, keep could just could move us off to a, like taking a fork in the road, if you will. Uh, to maintain that metaphor of that of that journey to Jerusalem, and what is it that can uh, that that can pull us away from that uh, from that destination? And there's a lot, there's a lot, and and rec and realizing that I the the one thing I would recommend uh, to in addition to our commentary on the website, I would also if you have on your desk or in your library. Uh, the women's Bible commentary on this passage. I think it's really helpful to have a sense of how uh, historically from, uh, from interpretation, uh, interpretive history, just how this passage is. Uh, I, we, I think a lot of us have some inclinations about it, uh, uh, the way in which it kind of gets used to pit people, uh, you know, pit women particularly against each other, but there's a there's a larger historical context of that too. So I would just recommend that people take a look at that. Thank you. Yeah, it's a that. passage that uh, unfortunately can trap a lot of us preachers in, in some of our favorite moves. And I'm and here I'm talking about archetypes in general. Like if you're, you, so many interpreters have tried to make these two women in this scene become these archetypes of different kinds of responses to Jesus or different kinds of discipleship, hospitality, active service versus um, cont com contemplative, um, you know, more of a, a kind of a listening posture. 
which is really unfair, not just to different kinds of disciples. It's really unfair when we gender this and make this a story, quote unquote, about women or about women's discipleship. It's really unfair to the text as well, because there's just not, it doesn't seem to be trying to calling out to be an archetypical story. Um, uh, Mary never speaks. Mary has really very little role in this. This is largely about a dispute or a, a lack of understanding or a gentle correction between Martha and Jesus. Um, and so we just need to be really careful about that because again, so many, that's, I do that all the time in preaching, right? You see a person who then becomes an exemplar of a way of being in the world. And then you either praise it or you blame it or you problematize it. And so that's one thing, right? I, we might need to change our way of preaching around this text if you're somebody like me who thinks they're simplifying mm -hmm. the text, but actually in this case might be doing violence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's agree, no archetypes this week. <laughs> um, that focus like on that. worry, I think is key. Again, this is kind of like, it's as if Jesus is saying, you know, when I'm present, I get all the attention, which makes Jesus sound needy, but that's part of what it means when the Messiah is in town, right? And the whole thing about wineskins and not fasting when the bridegroom is present. There's something about not just hospitality in general here, but what does it mean to be hospitable to Jesus? And, and that's a complicated thing. But as always in Luke and also in Acts, when salvation's around, there is some kind of hospitality taking place, but there's also a kind of revealing that takes place. And it seems like Martha perhaps is trying to shut that down mm. either for herself or for her sister or for us, the reader, and, mm. and thus, uh, thus the rebuke. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I still, I can, I'm never satisfied with where I come out on the other side of this story. Well, I, I think that that focus or that mention of presence is important, Matt, in terms of where we are, right, again, in this overall, the overall travel narrative. But as we move through Luke in the next couple of weeks, we have that, there's that growing sense of urgency uh, that, and, and that growing sense of uh, kind of a, that apocalyptic undertone, uh, as you, and which is, of course, about revealing, but it's, the, the journey is going to come to an end, and I uh, and that's that's that hovers right over this whole time, and so there is a call to here to a kind of presence that is with Jesus, that is uh, a kind of um, a, a kind of deep attentiveness, maybe, or uh, that you know the incarnation or Jesus' presence isn't going to be here forever. And so how is it that you, not to, not to, again, sort of not archetype it, but like over metaphorize it or something, be in the moment. Uh, but there is something to that of, of recognizing, uh, recognizing Jesus in front of you and what is Jesus calling you to do and to be in this moment. Uh, and how is it that you are, and it really goes back to, goes back to the beginning of Luke, right, in terms of repentance, what are you seeing in this moment, are you seeing how Jesus sees, and seeing whom Jesus sees, and so those larger themes of, of attentiveness, I think, are brought to the surface here as well. It, I, I love this uh, focusing on the presence, and um, since this is a post-resurrection um, reading for us, uh, we're 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 uh, a few weeks out of having uh, celebrated um, uh, the resurrection, and are uh, rereading these stories with the rumors of the resurrection in our imagination. And uh, like I said, my focus is 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 really kind of turned to the prophetic. Uh, text that we will be reading over the next few weeks. And if we look at that as kind of a backdrop, when God was not visible, as God in Jesus is not visible for us now, what does it mean for us to have that faith, that confidence in the presence of Jesus that, that Matt was talking about? So not only in the moment that is rehearsed uh, uh, in this particular episode, but how do we then, knowing that God is with us, live um, in the presence of God? Um, so I love that, 
but I, I want to do that in an immediate sense um, as well, not just in the text moment. And that becomes a challenge for us uh, as we preach this. Mm -hmm. Should we go to Genesis? I, I, I think that the, the pairing... Reality. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I think that the pairing of Genesis 18, it's, it looks like an odd choice, but it really is a bit of a lifeline to Martha. I think the lectionary framers have said, you know, before you, you talk about Martha as not knowing what she's doing or not being a good enough disciple or something like that, um, look what happens when God appears to Abraham and Sarah and all the running around. Mm -hmm which Abraham does, but Abraham largely makes other people do the work for him. <laughs> it's, it's nice to be the, the patriarch or the warlord or whatever he was, you know, but, um, but it's a story that talks about the need for the guest, the needs of the guest, the comfort of the guest, provision for the guest comes first and needs to come first. Mm -hmm. And then God will reveal something to Abraham and Sarah in this story. Um, so on the one, yeah, I, I think if I push that too far, it would look like Abraham's making everybody else work so he can sit and have the place of honor with these guests and mm -hmm. there's a, some truth to that but it's also a, it's a it's the text is many things but one thing it is is an ode or a praise of hospitality mm -hmm. toward god mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. i i um I appreciate that recognition that we could extend that, but since we are not doing archetypes here, um, we, we kind of protect ourselves from going down that road, but, but thanks for that warning, uh, Matt. Um, I, I agree that this is an opportunity to pause with the hospitality that's extended. Um, I would uh, remind us to uh, remember that Abraham is in a period of waiting um, you know, he got the promise, um, according to our numbers, you know, six chapters ago. Um, but, you know, he, he, he's been living with this promise and not yet re re received it. And still, despite his shortcomings, he's extending hospitality in this moment. Um, and, and so when Abraham is lying, when he's scheming, all of this is in self-protection. If, if you think about, you know, why is he saying, okay, this is, these are the people that we're dealing with. And so um, I need us to do this, Sarah, you're going to have to say this. All of that is about self-protection. But if we remember when you're on a journey to keep that journey metaphor before us, uh, particularly in, in, the, in this time on a journey that he doesn't fully know where he's going, to be able to give to extend hospitality to a visitor that shows up actually is losing your own self-protection. So it, in some ways, this could be a stark contrast uh, to the practices of self-gratification that we will read in a few verses. And instead it causes us to linger in the fact that trusting God to take care of him, Abraham, can extend hospitality. And if we take that idea that I was suggesting in Luke, um, how do we do that? How do we, while we're waiting on the promise to be fulfilled, how do we still practice right and just acts that extend hospitality to others? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Good. So Amos, right? Are, you, are we going to move on? <laughs> we can. Plum line yeah. last week. Yeah. Summer fruit this week. These are the mm -hmm. two, maybe the most famous images. Mm -hmm. And Amos picks up right from last week, which was a harsh oracle. And now it's a scathing criticism of the business practices and the, the predatory behavior in this society. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the world has moved on from that. We've gotten rid of those problems from our societies. Mm -hmm. Okay, you stopped reading the newspaper, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> a little sarcasm, you know, in honor of Amos there. Yeah. Right, when will the new moon be over that we can sell grain and the Sabbaths so we may offer wheat for sale, right? When can we get past this religious observance stuff so we can make money? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And then let's, uh, let's see if we can change the weights and measures so mm -hmm. we can rip people off a little bit more, which, you know, on the one hand, it's easy to point and say, these, this is about you know, those businesses and those business practices that are obviously bad. But I think of all the ways in which this creeps into everyday living and 
-hmm. with a you know our own distorted our our means of measurement being distorted mm -hmm. our means of assessing the value of something being distorted and so therefore we whether we're talking about commodities or just like virtues or how we choose to live our lives um what happens when the measuring stick is broken and who suffers for that are usually the those who are in most need of fairness well in a in a way not not these are you know these passages obviously are chosen for different reasons one the thematic and one the semi-continuous but in a way what what's happening here as amos is a different sort of uh way to think about what hospitality is uh that that you know hospit what does hospitality mean how do we define that and and part of what hospitality means is is that uh you know calling out when 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 the needy are not cared for and uh when the uh, what the overlooking of that, uh, which Amos is calling out, right? So that's a, it's an, it's different kind of expansiveness of what, you know, hospitality is, which is true for Luke, right? This is, this is not just, this is not just having somebody over for dinner and having a dinner party. This is, uh, uh and, and even in the Genesis passage of, of of entering into um you know a space i i think you know going back to genesis for just a second i'm just always that passage is so interesting because of the amount of space and the detail that is given to the the steps of hospitality it's not just that abraham extended hospitality it's like all you get all the details and and so that's it's i think it's worth sitting in that if you put all these texts together, what what are the details of hospitality? <laughs> um, put some put some flesh and blood and action action on on. It's not just be hospitable, but what does that actually look like um, in in society in real practice? I think is the, the kind of the theme that I'm seeing in these in these passages. I, I love it, uh, Caroline. We. Um, see here the um, context of, of this um, um, scathing um, accusation uh, that Amos is making. Um, what's missing is that hospitality you're talking about, the neglect, neglecting the poor, uh, the practices that are unjust, the, the unbalanced scales uh, that, that Matt was reminding us of. And um, if you put the people's failure through the course of the book of Amos, um, what we have is um, this larger failure being focused on now in the Northern Kingdom. They've had leadership, kings of Israel who have failed, uh, who have been successful leaders but have failed to keep the people practicing the justice of God that you were naming by turning us back to the Genesis passage. And, and I think that's our, our that's what makes this so hard. I mean, that's what makes the prophetic writings continue to be hard for us because who wants to be the one to say, look at our success, look at the promises that God has given us, see how we're taking this journey into these promises and then say, yeah, but God is looking at how we're failing his people. Yeah. God is looking how we're neglecting the poor, the specific injustice, right. uh, the practices. And that's what that's what this prophet is doing. Right. Um, and, and particularly in chapter seven, eight, nine here. Uh, so we're in the middle, we're, we're in chapter, chapter eight. And um, at the end, we're gonna get to this recognition that God's goodness, if God is good, then at some point, the patience of God is going to have to reach its end and God is going to judge. And that's the warning, because we know at the end that Israel winds up judged. They wind up in exile. Yet, and this is, I'm, I'm moving fast forward at the end of the book, because we have to always read this in hindsight and know what is coming. And that is living in the promise. The promise is there will be a restoration, but because of that promise, doesn't mean we get to act like the present moment isn't important. Right. Yeah. The present moment of practicing justice and loving our neighbor seems to be what is really getting God's attention. 
Well, God I isn't going to stop being faithful, but yeah. God is going to judge our unfaithfulness. And I think, you know, two things that I hear in what you're saying that, that, that I want to lift up, uh, Joy, that I think are really important. One is like, how do you define hospitality? And how you're defining hospitality is just the justice of God. You know, how, how do you act out God's justice and God's goodness? Right. So that I, and then the other thing is the way in which we, I, you know, it would be helpful, important if you're going to preach on this passage for the preacher to go back to the opening chapters of Amos and where it, where, you know, Israel is kind of sitting on its morals. And because Amos is like, woe to you or Tyre and Sidon, woe to you, the Moabites. And, you know, so Israel is like, kind of like, go Amos, go Amos, you know, bad Tyre, bad Sidon, bad Moabites, bad Ammonites, you know, and then Amos says, and woe to you, O Israel. Right. And bam, that's. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's like if we, see the echo of how Naaman gets, uh, Nathan gets David mm -hmm. to acknowledge his sin. Yeah. It's like, let's point it out and get Israel to say, yes, that's, that's not right. That's not right. Yeah. And now let's talk about what you're doing. And it's like, oh man, we've already judged ourselves. Yeah. Let's turn. Yep. And that's the judgment. That's the judgment because we've already said all oh, tired. Oh, yeah, go Amos. I love that. I forgot. I love it when you do that. But now it's on us. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, Psalm short, 15. So, hmm? Nice and short, nice and short psalm. Yeah, I like short psalms. <laughs> it has an image of hospitality as well, though. Who gets to abide with God? Whom does To whom does God offer hospitality or God offer welcome? And mm hmm yeah. The good people, <laughs> but it, yeah, it's an image, right? Of how of hospitality as a, as a theological theme gets a lot of criticism and for good reason, when it becomes a one directional thing, right? When it becomes a kind of condescending charity that doesn't really involve welcome. And I get that. Um, and I, so I always wanna make sure we're, we're defining or glossing what we mean by hospitality. Uh, but here's a case where it's also a reminder that uh, we show hospitality to God in some of these texts. God shows hospitality to us. And some of that is just language of gift and language of connection, I think, in relationship. Relationship. Very much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for the moment that we're living in right now, and this goes back to your, your um, reminder to us uh, at the beginning with the gospel, not to do the, uh, um, the uh, archetypal char character. Anti-archetype this week, Anti this week only. Right, right, this week only. Um, but in, in verse three, while we're asking this question of who gets to abide, verse, verse three challenges us not to make that judgment. It's almost like we were talking about, you know, in, in, in Amos, it's like, we don't get to say, we don't get to slander our neighbors. We don't get to point out at what others are doing and saying, I'm better than this. So whether we're talking about, are you more like Martha? Are you more like uh, Mary? Are you more like the Northern Kingdom? Are you more like the Southern Kingdom? Are you Judah or, or Jerusalem? Or, uh, it, what this Psalm says is as it's asking the question, it's extending the hospitality so that even as we make judgment, we don't get to slander. Mm -hmm. We don't get to take reproach against our neighbor. And in this moment in, in our culture, I think it's important for us to read that as we read the verses uh, around verse three. Yep. Yep. I'm a big Colossians fan. The older I get, the more I like Colossians. I, uh, well, good for you. Good. Great. That, that felt a little <laughs> condescending. I didn't mean it in a, it's in, a little in, condescending. In a, in I think what you're getting at is any never kind mind. of coachful kind of way. What? No, I'm, I'm going to drop it. <laughs> okay. No, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get in there. I've liked gonna... this for a while and I don't know how old that makes me. So let's move on. What were you going to tell yeah, so <laughs> Matt, why do you like, why are you liking Colossians in your older, later years? You know, there was a time when I would, look, would have looked at this part of Colossians and been, this is a theological feast. There is so much in here that's so heavy and so big. 
I mean, I've preached on this and tried to em emphasize some of this about, about embodiment and incarnation and notion of mystery and the, the cosmic scope. I mean, you know what I mean? Like a, you give this text to a theologian and they're going to just chew on it for days. But here's the thing is that, remember, this is a letter that first and foremost is about reassuring readers that all is well. It's a, I think I'm convinced Colossians is a letter that at least for the first three chapters is dedicated to telling people you don't need to seek out other stuff. You've got, you are where you need to be. In fact, you're already raised up with Christ. And so don't worry about signing up for that seminar. Don't worry about supplementing your spirituality. Don't worry about trying to get ahead. Don't, don't treat the Christian life as if it's this kind of endless um, string of accomplishments and ways of leveling up, right? But instead it's all set. So it's just, it's a nice reminder that nobody does or nobody, I should say, should do theology for theology's own sake, mm -hmm. right? Theology is about building up the saints. It's about building up confidence and faith in who Christ is. And this is a passage that when we read it in context should remind us of that. And that's what it means to be mature in Christ, I think, to use that final phrase here that it's it's partly realizing that faith isn't about figuring everything out but it's about trusting that christ is sufficient so that's what i like about it maybe it helps me when i'm old and tired <laughs> i know i'm just old not tired well i this particular section and the commentary i found really really helpful mm -hmm. uh and the, and the one line i want to lift up from the commentary you know the, the 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 conversation around the christ hymn and is that uh, you know is that doesn't quite fit the current context because you have this reference to church you know what is that what is that doing here and then the commentary suggests that uh, how is this inviting or provoking readers to reflect on how church and cosmos intersect in Christ? And I think that would be really a worthwhile moment of reflection for the preacher and to preach on like that, that, that the church, because how and, and but how that how that really that whole question has been exposed in the pandemic that churches can't be so insular and located in these buildings that we're intimately connected with the entire cosmos and uh, and what different how would church be different if we recognized that the as as the commentator said the common uh, commentary says the story of christ's ecclesial body is wrapped up in the story of the whole created order how would we do church differently how would we think of how would we define ecclesiology differently how might that question inspire and and give imagination to preachers right now as we move into really i think redefining church